I'm going to talk about a few things. And uh, you know, I was trying to think about trending topics for budding entrepreneurs like yourself. And it's a smorgasbord. So um, tell me if you're not that interested in one of these topics, and I'll go really fast. I'm going to go really fast anyway, because that's how I am. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some lessons from Snapfish. It was a roller coaster ride. I, um, we, start, we sold the company twice. One time we lost an enormous amount of money, and the other time we sold it for a, a good amount of money. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about, because I think one of the key questions that entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs have is, what are investors really looking for? So um, my career is that I was doing the internet stuff uh, since 1992, actually, interactive stuff, because there wasn't really the internet. Al Gore didn't invent it yet. And then uh, I went to HBS, and then I went uh, and, uh, to Excited Home, which I'll talk about, uh, which was an internet company. And then after that, started Snapfish and did that for six years. And then I've been a VC for seven years. So I've been on kind of both sides of the table and can give you that perspective. Another question which is relevant uh, is Silicon Valley or not. Um, Jeff brought up some good points about Boston. And I think if you're thinking about starting a company, where you do it is an important question. And you need to think about where you want to be. And I'll attempt to say the good and the bad and the ugly about Silicon Valley. And then the last thing is I'm, I'm actually launching a new initiative this week, a, new, a whole new thing. So after seven years in Mayfield, I want to try to disrupt venture capital. And so I'm going to tell you about what I'm doing new because I think it's actually relevant for a lot of you uh, people here. And I'd love to hear your feedback on that as well. So uh, I'm going to try to go through Snapfish pretty quickly because I can get really bogged down into this. So, um, but the first, bo first story is that you know I started uh, early on, what were the influences to me? You know, went to Carnegie Mellon, was a nerdy engineer, didn't know anything about entrepreneurship. And I wasn't really, I grew up in this kind of little rural town in Pennsylvania, so I didn't have very good role models. When I got there, of course, as a good engineer, I went to the Robotics Institute, thought that was cool, started making some robots, thought I'd love to be an engineer, and found out it was kind of boring. And so I met this entrepreneurship professor in the business school, and this is part of the lesson one is, venture outside of whatever school you're in. because. Probably the most interesting people don't even, are not in your major. Uh, they're somewhere else. Jack was an entrepreneurship professor, started several businesses. And he's like, if you love products and engineering, but you also like leading and, and you know, businesses, you should be thinking about an entrepreneur. I was like, huh, what's that? And so he introduced me to that. And then I said, OK, the best way to learn about it is to become president of the Entrepreneur Club, since I know nothing about it. So I did that and got exposed a lot to it and realized that this is something I want to do. Finish the engineering degree, but that was just a means to an end. So the, the lesson that Jack told me about also was really build your networks. Because from your networks, whether it's HBS, undergrad, Harvard, whatever, that's where the opportunities come. Luck doesn't hit people. They position themselves underneath luck, and then luck hits you. And so uh, sometimes by chance. So when I graduated, I had some offers to be like a plant manager at P&G and work at a chemical company in South Carolina. This is what like, mechanical engineers have to look forward to, graduating from Carnegie Mellon. So, um, but this other company, Bell Atlantic, which is now Verizon, said, hey, you want to do this executive education program, and we'll teach you how to be in business. I was like, what's telecom? But little did I know that I joined that uh, company, and they were the kind of first people going into interactive media using broadband before the internet. And they exposed me to this hockey stick that was going to happen, which was this thing called the internet. This was 1992 to 94. Realizing that you can't get anything done except PowerPoints in a phone company, I left and went to HBS, where I made more PowerPoints. Um, but there, actually, um, I looked at that as an opportunity to say, hey, this internet thing's really cool. So no one's really involved. And I came and I looked at all the clubs on Canvas, and there was no such thing as the tech media club, and, or whatever it's called today, I don't know. But um, it was a communications industry club. I said, that's boring. So I, me and another friend started the tech media club. And it was the first internet club at HBS. The cool thing about that, the lesson there is that no one really knew what they were doing. In 19, this was 1994 to 96. No one had a clue about the internet. This was like Jerry Yang came and spoke at our club, and there was three people at Yahoo you know, that, that came out here. And so by virtue of no one knowing anything, you can become an expert in everything. So I called up all the VCs in Silicon Valley and said, I am the president of the tech media club at Harvard. They're like, come visit us. So that helped me then. That was kind of my job search, which is calling them out. And I took the advice that Jeff said, too, which I think is important. If you don't have this burning passion about creating a company, but you want to be an entrepreneur, go work at a company that's well-networked, well-financed, because you'll learn a lot there. And so I met a bunch of VCs. They all told me to go to Netscape, which was going public. But I thought that was already kind of done. So I joined this startup, which was called At Home, 
which later we went public and merged with Excite, and we became Excited Home. And it was a broadband play, and it was kind of like what I'd initially learned about anyway. And it was a bunch of HBS grads that hired me. I did a field study there. Then I got a job offer. Field studies are another lesson that are a good thing. But, you know, life is cushy there. It was, you know, the company went from zero, went public, $9 billion. I don't even know if we had revenue at the time. And things were pretty cool. I was made the general manager of e-commerce, 50 million in my division. I think it was all round trip money uh, between us and AOL. And I had like 50 people I was managing. And so I learned how to be a manager there, which was cool. But when things were going great, they were giving me all these new options. They were going to promote me. Is exactly the time, it was 1999, I said, you know what? I'm not sure the world's going to get any better than where it is right now to start a company. And when, you know, I always, the, another piece of advice is leaving a high note. Um, so rather than waiting for them to kick me out, I uh, got together with three people and we decided to start a company. The company choice was pretty interesting because being exposed to multimedia, I looked at, I love the media space and I thought this is all going to be disrupted by the, the broadband internet. There's music, movies, and photos are the three big areas that were my interest. And I'm a musician also. I'm in a band. So I thought that's cool. And I kind of did some work in music and found that it sucks. No one makes money in music except for the labels. And now even the labels don't make money. I looked at movies, and the internet was too slow at the time. It was just people didn't have the connection. So the last one, by default, was photos. And I knew there was a transition. And the big thing is disruption leads to a lot of opportunities. And we'll talk about that later as far as what opportunities I see. But it was around photos. And I thought this is user-generated content, but the word UGC wasn't cool in 1999. And it's viral, so we can lower customer acquisition costs. And there's probably a business as people go from film to digital. So I wanted to provide a bridge business, get people with their film cameras, do all this free processing for them, get their photos online. And when they go digital, we own them all, and we can get all of their money. And so we started Snapfish, uh, an online photo service. At the same time, 110 other companies started. And so we had a lot of competition. And three of us managed to raise a significant amount of capital, Ophoto, Snapfish, and Shutterfly. Uh, which, and, but let me go back to, I'll talk about the capital later. Um, you know, I recommend co-founders if you're thinking about starting a business um, because we all have gaps and we need to know what they are. You need to be self-aware. But make sure you're, they're not just your buddies. Trust and friendship is not enough. Go read Noam Wasserman's book, Founding Dilemmas. It's good, but it's not enough. You need someone that's complimentary. And so the point of the slide is not that we were all Indian, and that's how we were similar. Uh, that just kind of happened. But um, really, all of us brought something unique and interesting to the table. So you know, this guy was pretty good at product. This guy was pretty good at schmoozing and BD tech. But he had a real business. And I love a CTO, especially in today's world. This isn't about fundamental technology. This is about application. So you need someone who has a business mind. And he was really focused on what's the bottom line of why I'm creating this code. And then me on the product side. But what's interesting is, as things didn't work later, which I'll tell you, and we all failed, the overlaps, I kind of did both of these. And there wasn't enough room, and we had to shrink the company, so these two left. And so it was really just the two of us, which really did fill in the gap of each other the most. So the four of us were definitely great, and we're all friends. But at the end of the day, when we had to shrink the company because of death, we went to kind of who are the two people that have the skills that can cut across the most. In today's world, it's probably two co-founder situation more so than others. So early on, when you start a company, you're basically, if you're not spending your time on funding, building product, or recruiting, you're wasting your time. Those are the only three things that you should be doing. And um, we were able to go out, because I had a little bit of a reputation, so did uh, the other guys that started with me. Two of them were HBS grads, by the way. And that's probably a bad thing. You probably shouldn't have too many HBS grads that your co-founders with. They're, that's another issue. But anyway, three of us were, and one was a tech guy. And uh, we raised $7.5 million on a PowerPoint. Doesn't happen today. Um, and we wasted about seven and in the seven and a half million. You know that great company was talking about EMC? I had to buy it, pay seven million dollars per piece of freaking storage um, to store photos. Seven million dollars. Today you pay zero because you use it on demand uh, from Amazon. So we raised seven and a half million. We went from four to forty people in three months. And you know, it was I spent literally once that funding was raised, I spent 80% of my time recruiting. Recruiting, 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 recruiting. Because at the time, just like kind of today, it was a super competitive environment, especially in San Francisco slash Silicon Valley. So you can't spend enough time recruiting in those first 20 people to find the company. And then you know, I was asking about when we should raise our next round. And the best advice I got was you either raise it before you launch or way after you launch. Because if you raise it right after you launch, they're all going to wait for data. 
And the other piece, which I wasn't smart enough to figure out was, and also make sure you do it sooner is better because the world may change. So we were lucky enough to start our fundraising process. We launched the service officially in, I think, in April or May of 2000. And what I didn't know is that in June and July, the world would go off a cliff and there would be no more funding. And we had just closed, and, and we, so we were able to get from four random companies, that I don't know why they invested in us, with the exception of Kodak, um, who uh, wanted to disrupt us and kill us, so they thought they'd be close to us. Um, they put in $36 million. And we did that right before launch. Again, probably not something that's a lesson to be learned today, but what I, the lesson to learn is raise whenever you can. Don't wait. The world changes. Tomorrow could be the Armageddon. It's 2012, December, right? It's all going to end. Um, so we raised 36 million bucks. Um, that was good. These investors, if anyone's here from them, sorry, but they were pretty useless. Um, but at later stage rounds, it doesn't matter as much in terms of who's really investing in your company. I had the advice in my Mayfield and all the other people early on were helpful. Um, so we launched. We had 36 million in the war chest. We spent a shitload of it on marketing, wasting money, just like all of our competitors. Our competitors, by the way, outraised us. So they all raised like 75 or 100 million dollars. And um, we launched, and we thought we're going to get all these film users, and we'll give it away for free because we saw Bill Gross give away free PCs. If he can give away free PCs, we can give away free film processing. And then we'll get all these users, and they'll come on, and then they'll convert to digital, and we'll, we'll create a company. That's how we're going to beat everyone. And um, what I didn't realize, and, and so the solution was free processing. Get the film user where they are. Don't wait for people to change habits. And that was the growth curve I thought we'd have in the weeks after we launch. And none of that happened. It was a total flop. We could not change consumers' behavior. We thought that because we gave away all this stuff for free, this, people would give it to us and they'd put it online, they could see it, and we had this elaborate business model of they would see it first online, they'd click through 30 times, and we'd get $30 CPMs per click. It's wrong. And you know, they'd buy all this stuff afterwards. The biggest issue was that people didn't really have a big pain point. They were used to going to their drugstore and giving their film processing for five bucks. And here we're saying, because we weren't having a retail, you have to mail it in. So you have to mail it in to this little company you have no idea that's giving it away for free. And guess what? If we lose your film, you're hosed. So that $3 transaction probably had $500 of perceived value in it. And that was the problem that I did not realize until we launched. And so what it took was basically there to be a discontinuous change and for consumers not to have habits, which was digital. But in the meantime, it didn't work, and time was ticking, and 2000 went by. 2001 started to hit. The Armageddon was clear. The stock market was going to shit. These are all the internet companies and their stock prices over that time frame. No one wanted to touch us. In fact, our investors said, oh, this is a retail business. We're not really retail investors, so um, maybe we should sell the company. So I was like, well, what do I do? Um, so I, you know, I hired a banker, as everyone told me I should do. I paid them $300,000 to go and pitch a piece of crap to someone that would buy it. And no one did. Um, so at the end of the day, I'm the and, and I thought to myself, at this point I kind of figured out, OK, it's not working for film, but I really believe this will work for digital. But I couldn't tell anyone when digital cameras are going to start to penetrate. And so I said, trust me, it's going to happen. We just need to lean up. You know, We were 120 people. And so our supplier kind of raised their hand and said, and here's this guy I got to know. He had his company public. He took it back private. He's in Potomac, Maryland, old school film processor. Says, you know, if this was really cheap, maybe I'd buy it. So we had about $40 million of invested capital in us. We sold it for about $10 million, and half of it he put into debt. So 25 cents in the dollar went back to my investors. I ended up doing the deal myself and threw out the bankers. And um, they were just happy that they got 25 cents for every dollar that they invested. But that was sale number one of Snapfish. And he said, you promise at least you're going to stick around for a year. And if you believe in this vision, I'm going to teach you how to run a business because you're running a business that should be managing pennies, not spending superfluous money on storage and marketing and stuff. So he taught me then, under his wing, how to run a business. We went from 120 people down to 20 people. We went from beautiful offices on Market Street in San Francisco to windowless offices on Geary Street. And we learned how to run a business. We hunkered down. We pivoted. And we realized, who's our customer? Take a step back. We're competing against 100 companies. They're all trying to go after everyone. Maybe if we just focus. And we focused on Emily. She lives in Iowa. She has two kids. She really wants to take photos and will print them. And Emily, at that point, was just starting to get digital. And she was an AOL user. 
And AOL users don't like a lot of features and functions, so we cut our feature set down. And we focused on the digital user and just waited with a low burn rate rather than trying to do something with film. And we thought we'd still get that evolution, but really it was the digital point that got us. So it started to work. Our numbers grew, and we hit a hockey stick. Some of it was because we were good. I have to pat myself on the back. You know, we were good at analytics before most people were in acquiring customers on Google and with our partnerships. But also, a lot of it was because we hit a, a big wind in our back, which was digital camera penetration finally started to happen. In like 2000, you can see it right in the beginning, end of 2001, 2002, right after we sold the company, it started to take off. And so um, it started to work. And things were really, you know, we went, we were growing revenue more than 100% year over year, got the company profitable. And then expanded the vision. The, you know, one of the first things I did was, as soon as we knew it was working, and I was obsessed with getting a real business now and getting it profitable. I, as soon as we went into profitability, I took a step back to our owner and said, first of all, OK, the, the volunteer work is done. Now we want a piece of the company. And he carved out a piece of the company back to the people that are there. But it wasn't the same as founding it. Two is that now it's working. I'm confident we can always go back to this position. Let's step on it, because this is a competitive space. So I wanted to, I had a vision of, let's put these photos on TVs, on mobile phones, let's go into retail, let's sign deals with the big retailers. And I've laid out a $6 million plan, and, he was, and we went out and pitched Sequoia, because we said, look, we're still a separate company, let's go get some capital in it. We pitched other VCs. And he kind of smiled the whole way along, and he said, yeah, this is a good plan. We'll probably do it for four, not six. And no, I don't want any capital. And I was like, oh, boy. Because I always thought if I had a VC, it would kind of force function of an exit at some point. I couldn't tell if this guy ever wanted to sell. So um, things were going well, but you know, I was faced with this dilemma. And about that time in 2004, Mayfield knocked on my door and said, hey, we're back on the internet. This is my original investor. And this is going against what Jeff has said before, which is that you know, if you make money for your investors, it's, they'll remember you. I lost money, but they still said, hey, do you want to come and join us? Because they saw that Snapfish 2.0 was very successful. And, and then I had this tough choice of, well, I've created this baby. I've got some equity now. Not the same as being a founder, but it's working. But I have no idea whether this owner, who's a friend of mine, but is he really ever going to sell? Am I ever going to see anything come out of this? And then you know, all these visions of grandeur about being a VC were out there too. So I made the really tough decision at the end of 2004, 2005, and said, look, I'm going to take the job. And I told him, but I will take a long time. Six months, I'm going to find a CEO. I'm going to personally do the search. I'm not going to hire a recruiter. And um, there, you know, he wasn't happy, but he said, look, it's time. You've been doing this for six years. Fine. So I spent six months in doing that. During the period that I was finding someone, and things were going well in the business, um, a mixture of luck and good timing happened. So I was with some buddies surfing at Santa Cruz. And this is another thing. It's like, don't be surprised of where the real business contacts come out. This doesn't happen in Boston, by the way. We'll get into that later. <laughs> Um, and I was out there, with, and one of our friends that was surfing with us was a banker. And she's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm representing this company. They're really interested, you know, confidentially in this company, Shutterfly, which is one of our competitors. And, and, you know, I can't tell you exactly who it is, but can you give me some advice on how I can get this deal done? Because they're just asking for too high of a price. And I'm like, wait a second. And I had this, like, kind of acceleration clause that old school East Coast that the new owner got, which means that I, didn't, I knew that it would work out well for me so personally as well as for the whole team. So I was like, stop. I went back to Mayfield and said, I can't take the job right now. I think there's an opportunity to sell the company. And I went back to the owner, and he was not really interested in selling. But I'm like, look, you put $10 million in the company. What if we sold this for $100 million? I was like, and he was like, uh, no, not really, not interested. And I was like, shit. So, but I knew that <laughs> Shutterfly wanted to sell for like $600 million, because they had Jim Clark, the founder of Netscape, who's the big investor, and he thought this thing was going to the moon. He was right, because it's now a public company trading at $2 billion, but at the time, it looked kind of foolish. And so I thought, all right, I think I can get, do better than 100. But I, I knew one of the things I learned in life was it's all about managing expectations. So I went in, and I knew Shutterfly was way out there. And I went, and the, I found the company was HP. And I told them, first of all, at the first meeting that I'm not going to be around. Um, so I kind of, because I didn't have to stick around, go to my VC job. But I'm here making this happen. I took my CFO and said, he's the president. He's awesome. And he wanted the job, so that was great. And uh, I negotiated with HP, and I didn't use a banker this time at all, because I thought that was pointless the last time. And, um, I, knew, and I said, 500 million, maybe my guy will sell. <laughs> and they were like, are you nuts? And meanwhile, I went back to him and said, what if it's 150 million? Do you think he would sell? And he's like, maybe. 
And so then I came back after some negotiation, boom, we got the offer. It was a $300 million offer plus a 10-year service contract for the owner to do all the photo processing, which he made probably more money on over those 10 years. And so when I went back to him, because of his expectations were like maybe 150 and I said 300 he fell off his chair. And so we sold the company to HP, and so that was the second time that we were able to sell the company. And he made a 47 times return or something when you look at his equity investment into it. So that was a snappish story. Um, hopefully that was interesting. I'm trying to gauge. Should I? Okay. All right, so 10 quick takeaways. Don't wait for inspiration. Position yourself so it falls in your head. iLab's a great place to be because there's a lot of cool things going on. Don't sit in Baker Library. Um, data changes and it's never enough. Invest in your gut. Everyone is so data driven. And I was sitting in a case this morning about Cuba and everyone pulled out all the GDP numbers and all this stuff and there are like all these complicated strategies. And then the guy who's the, he's some oil guy who like went into Cuba and they're like, well, weren't you worried about this, this, and this? And he's like, no, I had no choice. I was about to go bankrupt, so I just had to go to Cuba. <laughs> he didn't even think about those things. Like, you know, don't overthink the situation. That's the MBA problem. Um, go for your gut. Passion is infectious. You got to have it. When you're in a competitive environment, you're not going to get great people to join you unless they see that you're willing to die for what you're doing. So that means, the corollary is, don't do something unless you're willing to die for it. Um, be crisp and confident when selling. People that have money don't have time. Don't waste their time. Uh, sell what they want, not what you want. This is a lesson you really have to learn after HBS because you're always talking about yourself. Now you have to think about empathy. Of what, is that, what does Kodak really want? And I have to change my entire story about them rather than what Snapfish really wants. Um, hire people better than you. We would not have been successful unless I had uh, my senior team with me. They were awesome and I had a lot of deficiencies that they helped. Um, you're always raising money. Um, this is obvious now today, hypothesize, get to market quick and iterate. It was harder to do it then. Plan always. I'm a big believer in putting a milestone out there because that's what gets people excited, but be open to change. Just because, you, just because the world changes doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan, just change your plan. And then balance is possible, but sometimes, not when you're in the middle of selling a company. Um, so let me switch gears now to what investors look for. Bottom line, disruption. Big investors, VCs, et cetera, make money when the tectonic plates shift. Internet was such a disruption. Within the internet, these were the disruptions. And big companies have been created. And every time this happens, I always wonder, like, why doesn't just some ad company add video? Why the hell is there a whole other set of billion dollar companies created when video comes out? But it is. Or why doesn't everyone just add social? No, a whole different set of companies comes out, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars created. Flickr, Instagram. Flickr, 23 million sale, Instagram, billion dollar sale. Um, so mobile is the disruption we're in right now. And you guys are capitalized, you're, you're well, you know, in good timing for you to go after it. But I think there's going to be another one. I'm not sure what it is. We'll talk about that. There are some other big trends. Um, I think connected TVs are interesting. So if you're thinking about ideas, it's just a really nasty ecosystem. Mobile's nasty with uh, Apple, but this is even more nasty uh, because of the cable companies and the television. But there's a lot. Just think about how much will be disrupted when new products and services that have to be delivered through the connected screen. Professional platforms. I'm a really big fan of this. We made several investments here. Um, individuals now are becoming the brand. The institution of Stanford and Harvard, I would go so far just to be provocative, which I'm usually not. Um, institutions like Stanford and Harvard should not exist as brands. It should be the individual who's delivering. You have one or two awesome professors. With the internet, they can create a brand. There's a company in Korea, because everything's broadband there for a long time, Mega Study, where it's about test prep for tests everyone has to take. It's a billion dollar plus market cap company in a little country like Korea. And it's because they empower teachers to have online brands and deliver. And you'll see billboards of the top teachers uh, that are all over the place in Korea because they're making such a massive business on it. Service marketplaces, so what's interesting here, the short of it is that I think for the most part it's really hard to disrupt media right now. It's like been disrupted. You're not fighting against Time Warner, you're fighting against Facebook or Twitter. Um, if you look at e-commerce, it's been disrupted and can't, I mean it's been disrupted already and it's being also commoditized if it's a commodity good. It's very hard. A lot of the discount models are not proving to stick as much as people thought that they were. This is the next area, which is services, offline services. People are adding a mobile interface to find things. Like I'm in a company called Lyft, 
which is like a P2P taxi service. It's about things where you're really paying money for, but you're doing a, mo a mobile uh, front end on it and organizing something on the back end. So I think that's an opportunity. E-commerce is turning out to be mainline in other countries because there are no, if you go to a second, third tier city in India, there is no good retail establishment and it's just leapfrogging directly to technology. So that's exciting, but not here. And um, I'm a big fan of new relationship graphs. So Facebook is only one graph, it's a social graph. But there's the social discovery graph, which one of my companies tagged, has 300 million users, is trying to create. Um, Pinterest has an interest graph, which is totally different. The connections that I have on Pinterest are actually very different than my Facebook connections. Um, and then education is really starting to get disrupted. I've been following the space for three years now, and it's finally starting to happen. So it's not just about mobile. There are these areas here that I think are ripe for more entrepreneurs uh, to go after. Did I just turn this off? I did. Okay. Um, one other thing that could be useful is two types of consumer businesses. So when, when, uh, when investors look at businesses, I think they categorize them, if, even if they don't tell you. There's one set of businesses which I would call disruptive new media. And this is really the black swan. It's really hard for you to create it. Um, it's that it's usually youthful founders, very product driven. We're talking about it's only interesting if there's 100 million plus users. And people are making massive bets on momentum because it's very hard to make a bet a priori on that. It's hard for a Harvard Business School graduate to go after that type of business, or someone old like me. Um, vertical destinations, much more akin to kind of more like businessy, experienced founders that have done it before, execution driven. Things like this are like Kayak. You know, that's the reason why it was done in Boston. Fixia, uh, which is a Q&A site that we invested in. Um, Business.com, shopping.com. So these are places where it's about traffic acquisition. Most retailers, Gilt falls in this category. Groupon falls in this category. Most of them don't have network effects, but they're execution driven. And you can still make money on them, but they don't end up being as big as the other ones. So know, my point is, know what type of business you're going into and where your strengths are, because it's actually very different. If you're going into B2B infrastructure, really quick, um, we're looking for experience. Um, Painkiller versus vitamin, this is probably the number one issue I have with most companies we see. Yes, the business would probably save money if they use your service. If they, someone sat in front of you for three hours and you explained it to them and they had $100,000, they're willing patiently to wait for three years to get an ROI. But that's not how the world works. Um, that's not how they're buying. So it has to be a painkiller. Um, we like things that have frictionless deployment, so not big instances anymore. Um, it's not avoiding the CIO, so it's all about open source social media. We're seeing amazing success on companies uh, that are growing grassroots this way. And in fact, we don't even look at companies that are trying to sell to the CIO anymore, our enterprise team. Um, I talked about immediate benefit. You know, every time there's a new feature on the internet, again, there's a whole new crop of enterprise companies that comes up. Jive Software, um, Yammer sold for a billion dollars. Who would have thought Twitter for companies is worth a billion dollars? Um, but every single time there's a disruption in advertising, real-time bidding, uh, video, social. So think about those waves and is there a company that owns that? And I'm always surprised on how big they can get. It, um, is this have future platform opportunity versus just being a feature or tool? And we like recurring revenue businesses here because enterprises are willing to pay. If it's one off, you got to resell every time. Um, so looking for great founders, some of, the, some of the things that, this is what I've talked to many investors, angels, um, seed, micro seed, VCs, et cetera, and this is what I've called away as what they're looking for in the person. Number one, they really do know them, or they're one degree away. It's really hard to make an early stage bet on someone you don't know. It's nice that you went to HBS, but it's better that I know someone. Um, product and user obsession. This matters the most. It's not about elaborate great slides and graphs. It's about, do you live and breathe? When I met, I put a term sheet on Pinterest actually and lost it in the seed level. Ben was just obsessed with every little pixel on what he was going to do and, and the community and, and how they would do it. Um, we're typically looking for founders who can code quickly. And if you can't, get someone as a co-founder. Um, deep understanding of the business metrics and product. We are looking for vision, especially, look, venture economics are such that if you have a $100 million exit, it really doesn't mean anything to a venture capitalist. And this is one of the biggest fundamental problems that's just not fixed, which is that it's very meaningful to you. It's very meaningless to us, even though you made money, because the fund sizes are so larger, and because we have so many other losers 
Right? Your, your thing doesn't really help. Um, so also looking for someone that's it's very competitive for talent. So we need to know that someone is very well connected, not just beyond knowing us. And this is an interesting one. A lot of people that start out that don't have experience don't know what an A-plus player looks like. And that only comes, that's where, you know, if you work at Dropbox or back in my day, Excited Home or something, you really can calibrate A-plus players. This is one of the advantages of the Valley, which we'll talk about, which is that there are a lot of A-plus players, and so you can calibrate that. If you grew up in Kissimmee, Wisconsin, and there's a developer, you could think they're A-plus. But who knows? Um, and we're not looking for the perfect CEO. But the most important trait is that they're self-aware. They know what they know, but they know what they don't know. And don't be afraid to say, I'm good at X, and I need people to help me at Y. So some general tips pitching VCs. Um, one of the first things is, again, we're investing in large markets. So know your TAM, bottoms up. If you don't think you can realistically get to $100 million in revenue, if it's definable, like if it's a black swan, whatever. But if it's an, if it's an execution play, if you can't make a credible story here, you shouldn't be pitching VCs. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do the business. It just means that you're going after the wrong funding source. Because they're not interested. Time and time again, everyone I talk to uses this simple litmus test. Billion dollar market or $100 million revenues? Can I, can I see one of those? Can I see it re realistically? And if you don't tell the story, they're going to have to try to concoct it themselves. And it won't work. Um, proof that the team is product and business savvy. So showing something in the past that you did. Um, is there really a true competitive advantage? This is something we all learn in business school. I, only, I think there's basically, there's one real competitive advantage in the internet, which is the network effect. Which is why most companies that have been massive, whether it's eBay, YouTube, Google with their advertising business, it's all network effect driven. And if you don't understand the network effect, learn it because that is the source of competitive advantage of most of these companies that are successful, whether mobile or not. Instagram had a, had a network effect as well. If it's not, you really have to say why you're disruptive to the incumbent. Because something incremental, like I, I, it's funny when some entrepreneurs come and say, I've talked to everyone at Google, and they don't have this in their plan for the next two quarters. Great, so it'll be in quarter three, and then you're toast. So I mean, you can't think if it's incremental that if it's not important that they won't get to it. Unless there's a network effect, then it doesn't matter if they get to it. Map out your serial risk reduction. I like to show a timeline on a slide if I'm an entrepreneur. This is my timeline of how I'm reducing risk in the business. Because that's what it's about, especially at the earliest stage. We don't care about losing money, at least on the West Coast. What we care about is that you quickly got to failure. Um, raise at least 18 months of capital if you can. This is the thing that kills every company at the end of the day is lack of cash. So cash is king. And I, I think everything takes longer than you think. Because it's really sexy to talk about pivots. But if you don't have the money, the pivot doesn't matter. And one of the most important things, if you can, control the process and the timing. When you're raising money, don't meet a VC for the first time when you're pitching them to raise money. It should be well and ahead. You should make an introduction through someone who knows you. You should have some coffee. You, should, you don't have to go over 50 VCs. Put 10 on your list or angels, whatever, whatever the group is. And get them comfortable with you because they're making a people bet. They want, you know, there's a degree of comfort after you meet someone and, do, and you know, have some coffee with them, have a drink with them, whatever, do something social that you don't have coming out straight. And so that's probably, um, there's just so many times I see that violated, and it's so easy to fix that. Like Jeff said, if you can't, you guys are all high-powered, charged people, you should be able to get to anyone uh, and meet them. So let's see. Um, let me switch gears now to Silicon Valley or not. So here's some of the good. And I, I'm going to go pretty fast on this because I think people are aware that, as Jeff showed, almost half of all dollars went to this little 30 mile. And Silicon Valley means San Francisco. In fact, San Francisco is probably more action right now than traditional Silicon Valley. Um, and only 12% went to the next place, which is New England, uh, in doing that. And that kind of velocity does matter, uh, especially if you're trying to create something big. Um, and what's more important is that three quarters of all the returns were made in Silicon Valley. So there's some real benefit there. And you know, the question is, why? And I think it's more about the mindset. It's not about the particular location. There's just, when you, when you go there, and there are pockets certainly that have that. I think this area has that mindset, but it's just not a critical mass the way that Silicon Valley is. Uh, Austin has that mindset, but again, it's just not as critical mass as Silicon Valley is. Um, and here's some of the observations I have. 
Uh, and I, came, I grew up on the East Coast, so I'm not a West Coaster. Um, I think a lot of people there, especially if they're trying to create the big companies, are more focused on how do I change the world versus making a buck. You know, a lot of people don't even have their revenue in their presentation when they're talking about it, if it's a really big idea. And actually, I don't, we don't think that's an issue. Um, there's a culture of paying it forward uh, versus, I would say, versus New York. I think Boston's a little bit more in the middle here. But, you know, it's very much New York is like, look out for yourself. Even LA is like that, too. Um, and in Silicon Valley, once you're there and people know you, um, they're opening up. Uh, because a lot of people that are successful there have time on their hands now. They want to help other people. Uh, in doing that. And that gives people a massive information advantage. Because you could think you're the most awesome idea or you have this thing, but there's probably 10 teams that are doing it right now. And if you were there, it's not on a blog somewhere. You kind of you understand it by, by knowing what's going on, by talking to people, and you get a real understanding of what's. And the other thing is that the dirty little secret when you start a company is that probably only 1% of your idea is original. 99% is copying the good shit out there. And it's usually by talking to someone that's built it. Like we have these like growth guys that are really good at virality tagged, and they happen to be got LinkedIn viral, they got High Five viral, they got Flixer viral, they got like 10 out of the 20 properties on the web viral. It's the same two guys because they kind of mastered that and then went around and shared that knowledge. Um, it is definitely people driven, so that's why relationships do matter here. Because so much of this is less about the technology now. And um, there is a DNA there of people that have gone big and scaled already. So that pattern recognition that we talked about is important. So th those are the, and then of course the other thing is it is hyper competitive. And that's the, it's a negative too, but that really brings out the best of people. And you think you're doing great, you know, but if you sell your company for a couple hundred million dollars, it's like whatever, because the guy next to you sold it for a couple billion. Or Kevin Seistrom from Instagram is DJing in Vegas for all of his friends because he sold it for a billion dollars. So you feel like, what am I doing? Um, so that competition can be a good thing. And the other thing in Silicon Valley is that people are just obsessed about product. Product, product, product. And you see it, so the biggest successes are about a great product. And um, that mindset has been pretty consistent. So what's the ugly? Um, well, it's expensive. Uh, maybe not compared to New York, but compared to here. And it's expensive not just for living, but for actually starting a company and doing that. So it requires capital. It's harder to bootstrap in Silicon Valley. Um, there's a massive talent war there. There's no doubt about it. And as Mark Zuckerberg said in an article, unfortunately, a lot of people do have shorter term thinking. Shorter term meaning that they're just jumping every six months to the next big thing that's there because it's in their backyard. Um, and that can be a challenge. So that, no doubt, that's a big issue that's there. Um, and this can be a negative. It's relationship driven. So if you don't have any relationships, you're an out, it really sucks. But asterisk, if you have momentum, all, everyone's your friend. And you can raise money, and you don't need really relationships if you're growing like this. And all of a sudden, everyone wants to be your friend, and then you have relationships overnight. Kind of like Hollywood. Um, but you know, that's the way it works. Weather, not. Don't say that. OK, bottom line, Silicon Valley, in my opinion, if, and this is kind of very biased. So if you're thinking big, if you like swimming with sharks, if product excellence matters in your business, some businesses it doesn't even matter. Um, if you have relationships or you've got momentum, and of course if you like good weather and wine, um, you should probably start your company in Silicon Valley. So last part, so I can have some questions. Um, what is this thing I'm doing called cofounder.co? Like I said, I spent seven years being a, a VC. I spent six years being an entrepreneur. And what I noticed out there is that there's something missing in the ecosystem. And so this is my attempt at making one dent uh, to, to do something different. And what I noticed is that entrepreneurs are looking for help, not just money. I'm sure all of you have thought about an accelerator. Maybe iLab is considered an incubator. Accelerators, incubators, they're going to angels, mentor advisors, VCs, all looking just, not just for capital. People realize, and it really does matter. It's not just about the money, especially at the early stage. Um, time is the most precious thing that people are looking for, the best people, of course. There's a lot of people that can't raise funding. But for those really amazing, talented people out there, if you ask them, they can get the money. It's not about the money. It's about they don't get enough of people's time. Um, so the question is, where do they go to get time, experience, and deep help? And you know, I was talking to Noam Wasserman about this, and he thinks there's over 100 key decisions that can make or break your company just in the first year. And you would want someone along the way there. The problem is VCs come in every six weeks. We have 12, 15 companies. 
really can't spend that much time. Um, Angels have 30 companies. Accelerators now, look, I think they're great. Like Y Combinator is an amazing brand. It's like going to the next generation. It's like the next Harvard. It is. That's what every you know, entrepreneur, I'm sure, is going to continue to apply there. But the, the issue is that it's three months, and you get a fraction of their time because they have 80 companies in the last class. So they can't really give you, you know, the principles that are there. It's hard to get the time. doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but it doesn't give that proposition as much as it does the brand. So that's where I thought, hey, is there a new model? And so the solution is, uh, what I'd like to do is go back to my entrepreneurial route, root, roots and standardize this concept of a co-founder, but make it part-time, where I could provide the time and the experience for critical decisions in a company. And the key thing here is to have a day a week cadence. So I'm looking for just a few entrepreneurs to go really deep every week, spending roughly a day a week. It you know, can average out to be more or less. And you can only do four to five companies in this maximum. But you come in as a co-founder, which is a very different role than coming in as an investor. Uh, in doing that. And it, only, it doesn't work for every venture capitalist. It only works if, I think, if you have a combination of you were a founder, otherwise you won't, what can you add? If you were a CEO, it's really helpful for the CEO. And if you were an investor, because you can understand how that other world thinks in doing it. Um, and I think what you also have to bring is deep relationships. So, you know, through my experience out there, there's capital, talent, partnerships, those are the four things that relationships matter the most for. Um, that are out there. And there are other people that, that fit this bill, but I thought, hey, this is, I'm a great guinea pig um, to try this new model out on. And really come in at the founding level of the company and be aligned as a co-founder. So, so the decision point that I'm looking at is you're about to start a company and you're going to go out and get a co-founder. And you think about who your co-founder should be and there's a certain equity percentage. What I'm going to say is, look, I'll take less than that, but it's still going to be meaningful, but I'm only going to spend a day a week. But you're going to get the benefit of my experience coming in. I'm not there to run the company. I'm not there to build the product. I'm there to be involved in every single one of those 100 decisions that are happening throughout. Um, and also, yeah, and I'll be vesting that equity. So the point is, is that I have skin in the game. So if the guy says, hey, you're a loser, Raj. After three months, you haven't provided me anything, boot me. But I wanted to say the same to you, too. And that way, you, know, you can continue uh, to scale the model. So that's the idea. And the key is to join, for me to join at the point of co-founder decision, because after someone raises money, it's very difficult uh, to come in as a co-founder uh, to do that. And this is kind of an unmet need, I believe, uh, out there, especially in Silicon Valley. My own personal long-term vision is that I'll find other people like me, build a network of people. Um, some of these people will do it like me full-time, four or five companies. Some of them will just do one. You know, they're retired. They want to work on one one day a week. And this is a whole new category, uh, just like an accelerator is, to help entrepreneurs. And we pool our equity together so that, because the question is, how do we make money? It's, through, it's similar to a fund economics. You'd have a similar ownership that a venture capital firm does, but you're giving your time. And we'd also throw some cash in just to uh, show that we are committed. And then you take it global, but that's later. That's like the big vision slide uh, in doing it. So my goal is, just like my friend Naval has started AngelList, just like angel.co is for money, that's why I got cofounder.co. Cofounder.co is for a partner. So um, what am I looking for? And this is part of the reason why, this is part of the selfish thing I'm doing, why I'm here, is because I think that this model works really well for awesome people that don't have relationships. Just because you don't have a relationship doesn't mean that you can't be a great entrepreneur. In fact, awesome companies are coming from all over the place. I still believe that the most great companies are scaled in Silicon Valley, but Drew Houston came from MIT. Brian Chesky from Air Airbnb came into Y Combinator from outside. Great talent is everywhere. But I think scaling a company in Silicon Valley. So I'm looking for um, founder, founders, could be more than one, that are awesome in all ways except for their experience, because that's where I think I can help. They really have to create a massive disruptive company. So this is not like an angel that's saying, well, let's see what it is, and we'll sell it for 10 million. I believe it's really difficult. No, one, no angel wants to now. There's a crunch going on. It's really hard to raise a Series A. There's all this angel money. And the angels are realizing, oh shit, unless this company can be venture backed, I should invest in it. And if it's venture backed, it should be disruptive. Otherwise, they're not going to invest in it. So I'm only going to focus on companies that I think are venture backed. And that's been my filter anyway. I've been doing a deal or two a year every year for the last seven years. And I'm going to just continue to do that at an earlier scale. Um, I want someone who has a very strong desire to be the CEO. This doesn't scale if they say, hey, you want to run the company? It doesn't work. Um, but I want them to be self-aware, so to understand what their shortcomings are, because maybe I can't help them. 
And um, I really am leaning more towards product obsessed builders. It doesn't mean that a HBS grad doesn't fit necessarily or someone that's not a coder, but this one typically is the best because they can iterate extremely fast. And you know, what I'm looking for is passion in a sector, but you're not wed to a solution. Because you're going to go out to the market and figure out what the right solution is and iterate, but you should be super passionate about some sector that you're going after. And like I said, you can start anywhere, but the person has to be committed uh, that they want to move to Silicon Valley uh, to build this company. Um, and because I'm not really competing with a lot of people, which is also nice at this stage, because no one else is doing this yet, um, I want to spend a lot of time. I want to spend, you know, have quick meetings, get to know people, but then I want to spend maybe two months. Because this is a marriage, and that's part of the, even if you don't go for this model, it may not be your cup of tea, with your co-founder, you better date before you get married. Um, it's really important, and I, and I think that's what's missing in today's ecosystem, too. We're making d investment decisions in a day or two, and we're supposed to be people-based. Great. Well, thanks for coming in. Now, um, I do want to say that I have to run to something, some Dean thing, which I'll be yelled at if, I don't, if I'm not late. But I encourage you, if you want to meet up, it's much more effective. Just send me an email. Uh, note that you are here tonight. And like I said, I'm here the whole week. If I can be helpful, I'll do my best. And I apologize in advance, but the schedule fills up, but I'll be back again, too. And um, also, if you just want to give me comments and say, look, this is a piece of shit, tell me. I'm open to it. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. <laughs>